Okay, so we have a few minutes left where uh, my hope was to highlight some of what I think are uh, really take home messages about the, uh, the research that was presented here today. While also I think highlighting some of the things that um, I think are really significant and important advances uh, based on you know, the findings that were presented today. So I want to start out with Erin's presentation uh, where I've taken some of the information from her slides. Um, and one point that I want to highlight uh, when it comes to research uh, on schizotypal personality disorder that I think is unique to that disorder is uh, that you know, given that it has been moved to a schizophrenia spectrum of, of diagnoses, I wonder about the extent to which our biological findings might inform diagnostic classification. Um, and so your findings were really interesting to me because I would have expected, you know, in schizophrenia, we tend to see, you know, lower volumes, we tend to see uh, deficits on cognitive testing. And so when I looked at your findings, I found it really interesting that what we're actually seeing in some respects um, is the maybe the opposite of what, have, of what I would have expected compared to healthy controls. Um, so for example, uh, if we're talking about frontal lobe uh, volumes, what, what you actually saw, uh, which is probably, I don't know what you actually expected, um, was greater volumes um, of the frontal lobes. And so I wonder a little bit about um, how biology and how this research might impact um, the decisions that have been made to uh, classify these diagnoses and, and move them you know, across different uh, areas of the DSM. Part of the reason this struck me is that I actually presented at ISSPD um, in Heidelberg last year some of the findings from a family study uh, where we looked at patients with borderline personality disorder as well as their first degree relatives using imaging. And what we found was similar to what we see in schizotypy, that even though we expected that uh, we would see greater frontal lobe uh, deactivation in the patients with BPD, as well as their relatives, and the controls would show the greatest levels of activation in this region, what we actually saw was similar to what you found here, which is this compensatory overactivation in the frontal lobes. So I think that, um, that when we put all this together, it does make me wonder a little bit about what these findings mean. And I think that uh, your interpretation along the lines of of a sparing of the frontal lobes and that it might actually be a protective factor for you know, florid psychosis is a really important point. So um, I do want to leave some time for questions, but I also want to talk a little bit about Dr. Konigsberg, pre Konigsberg's presentation um, because uh, as you see here, one of the main findings is that through treatment, uh, we actually see decreases in amygdala activation with this very specific intervention toward uh, improving emotion regulation. And so I think that it's important to highlight the significance of these findings. Um, you know, to me, what I think is really interesting is that this research um, is quite different from what has been done so far when it comes to the effects of a psychotherapy on uh, brain activation, especially emotion regulation in BPD. So what we've tended to see is research that uses a psychotherapy, such as uh, dialectical behavior therapy or TFP, what have you. Um, and we see um, over the course of treatment, you know, changes in brain activation, usually in the amygdala, uh, that, uh, that we you know, assume the, the intervention is having some effect, obviously, on brain activation. But what's unique about this approach is that it's very targeted. So we can actually understand a little bit more about what uh, intervention, in this very precise way, is affecting brain activation. And I think that the significance of this finding is that, as you alluded to, we might be able to build um, a more biologically informed uh, intervention in this kind of very incremental approach, starting with what we know is effective and is impacting brain activation, um, and potentially using that information to optimize treatment. Okay, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, as part of Dr. Ocola's presentation uh, 
is that, and it's something that one of my graduate students, I'll give him credit for it, Dean here, uh, highlighted to me, which was that genes, although you know, we have a number of studies linking various uh, genetic markers to BPD and other personality disorders, um, I don't know how many people were aware of this, but the RDOC actually has removed genes from the matrix. Was anybody aware of this? Okay, uh, so it was new to me as well. Thank goodness for my students being on top of things. Um, but as of May 2017, I'm reading from the RDOC website, uh, we removed references to specific genes from the genes column in the RDOC matrix. We recognize the clear relevance of investigating genomic aspects of RDOC constructs and domains. However, the current state of the field emphasizes the need for robust evidence of association, generally resulting from adequately powered genome-wide association studies, as opposed to candidate gene approaches. As we actively reevaluate the specifics of information to be included in this column, the RDOC matrix will be updated accordingly. So that was news to me. Um, but what I think is very unique about Dr. Cola's approach is that he's using uh, not only genetic markers, you know, these specific polymorphisms, but also combining this with PET imaging, which is a very expensive um, and sophisticated techniques, technique, and actually helps us to perhaps have more confidence um, given the converging evidence across MAOA genetic polymorphisms, as well as um, detecting different levels of this in the brain using PET imaging. So I, I, I hope this kind of puts a little bit, gives you a little different perspective on, on the, the significance of these findings. Some common themes that I think emerged from this research is that all of the studies were quite integrative and multimodal. We see uh, in uh, Aaron Hazlett's presentation, structural MRI, DTI, resting state, and task-based functional MRI um, being integrated to provide pretty consistent evidence, uh, which I summarized just a moment ago. In uh, Harold's presentation, we see an integration of functional MRI with psychological intervention, specifically this cognitive reappraisal training. And in Nathan Cola's presentation, combination of studies, uh, again, providing reasonably consistent results across PET imaging, MRI, and genetics. I also want to highlight that we're seeing here, I think, uh, and others might disagree with me, but some degree of overlap across brain regions that tend to be implicated in these different personality disorders. Um, and in particular, I, I'd like to highlight the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. I think it came up in everybody's presentation as being relevant um, in some respect to these personality disorders. And I think it's important to consider the role of that region, especially when it comes to self-regulation um, and the top-down control of emotion, um, and how this, what this might mean for uh, really the, the boundaries that separate these different disorders. I also think that we're seeing an increasing recognition of individual difference variables, personality, psychopathology, what have you, um, that might be associated with the neurobiological findings, that, um, that although we see these, uh, these uh, biological differences in patients with these disorders, we're also seeing that uh, certain uh, individual differences variables are linked to the findings in some pretty interesting ways, whether it's impulsivity, um, and I wonder a little bit more actually about uh, when we think about the cluster A personality disorders, uh, what might be linked to some of these findings? You know, is it, is it negative symptoms or, or, or that sort of thing? Okay, things that I want to put out there, and then I'm happy to open up the, uh, the, the room to further questions, although we're running out of time. Um, one thing that I think we need to do a better job of and that um, is, I think, increasingly important to acknowledge is the role of environmental factors in neurobiological research. I don't know what others have experienced when talking about biological findings to family members um, or people with the diagnosis, but that um, the, sometimes the thinking is that neurobiology is static and that it cannot be modified, and we have clear um, 
evidence from presentations today that, that biology can be modified uh, in a variety of ways. Um, but also considering interactions between genes and uh, distal factors such as abuse and maltreatment. In the research that I've been doing recently, understanding familial factors that play a role in, this, in these findings. Um, neurodevelopmental factors, we heard about ADHD earlier today um, in Dr. Schmall's presentation. Something else that I think uh, is important to highlight in the research that we're doing is highlighting the potential clinical utility of these, uh, of these findings. Um, we already heard a little bit, of course, about intervention and how neurobiological research can inform intervention. It may not be as obvious, um, but I think that the research that is being done, especially more recently, is considering you know, the incremental utility, uh, clinical utility of the neurobiological findings over and above self-report um, conventional clinical measures, um, and then using this information to identify people who might be at risk of developing personality pathology, um, predicting treatment response, um, and also helping to identify brain regions that might be targeted in specific ways. So for example, some of the research that I'm doing at the moment is looking at brain stimulation using magnetic seizure therapy to impact the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, in BPD. So I think that um, it's important to really highlight the importance of neurobiological research uh, on personality disorders. Finally, I would say that it's important to be thinking, at least from my perspective, uh, about how we can integrate and incorporate measures, individual differences variables. I actually took this quote from Aaron's presentation, individual differences and in dimensions of behavior or personality, psychopathology, that might be related to the findings in our research. And I think this is important to help to validate some of the, um, the alternative models that are being considered for personality disorders. So in terms of next steps, I think it's important that we continue to apply these multimodal and integrative approaches when it comes to studying the neurobiology of personality disorders, examining the role of environmental factors. As I just said, translating this knowledge into clinical applications with respect to assessment or prognosis or intervention, and then incorporating what um, might be considered more theoretically relevant individual difference variables into our studies. And I think that this can actually help us by uh, illuminating what are some of the cross-cutting symptom dimensions um, that may or may not be driving the effects that we see in our discrete, categorically defined diagnoses as well. I think that it's important that we use neurobiological le uh, measures to uh, provide uh, evidence potentially of validity for these alternative conceptualizations that are being considered uh, when it comes to uh, all, uh, sorry dimensional models of personality psychopathology. So I hope that these discussion points were helpful for you. Um, I probably have covered a lot of ground here, but are there any questions that uh, people have? We have one whole minute for that, if you do. Um, otherwise, uh, we obviously you can uh, speak to the presenters after this, uh, after the minute's over. <laughs> so, are there any questions that people would like to raise? Yeah. Right. 
a zero for each criteria, 0.5, a one, you yes. may meet the criteria, or a two for excessive, we add those up and get a measure of five to say 18. We get a correlation with that, and that was correlated with that hyperactivity in the frontal lobe. So the more SPD they were, the more fault mode network hyperactivity they showed. But we haven't looked at this, these sort of those subcategories of negative symptoms and so on. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yes, I think we'll so do I'm one. I'm curious why you chose uh, magnetic seizure therapy. I'm guessing you have a TMS machine to do that with. Uh, it's not me doing the intervention. <laughs> that is, yeah. But why that? Yeah, well, I think the advantage of um, MST over um, other techniques is, um, at least compared to ECT, we see uh, fewer cognitive side effects uh, related to that. Um, also, it's never been tested, and at least in um, my understanding, many people with BPD with treatment-resistant depression are receiving ECT, and they might also be receiving MST. Um, and so to systematically actually test the effects um, would be important, especially considering the, the fewer side effects on the cognitive side, so. Yes, I don't know if we're, actually I think we need to end, but I'm happy to, to chat with anybody after this presentation. So thank you very much for coming and for your attention.